with us today. Um, these talks are recorded as always, and um, you can find them on the S SMCI website. There's there's a few weeks delay um, before they're edited and put up there. Um, we are, uh, before I introduce uh, Dr. Shaw, I just want to welcome everyone, say a happy, happy Valentine's Day. Um, there is CME credit for this, all of these talks. And so that information will be in the chat. And then we have a special announcement from the Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement. Uh, we have uh, uh, winners of the paper contest, which I remember we announced um, a few talks ago. So I will turn it over to Sam Kling to share that information. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, yes, thank you to everyone once again uh, for submitting your papers for the uh, uh, Best in Improvement Publications uh, Award. And I, the winners were announced in this week's publication or this week's newsletter, and will also be invited to speak at this seminar series. But to give you a little flavor of our for, uh, top four papers. Uh, the first winner with uh, the best publication focused on the adult population is Patel and colleagues with effect of a community health worker intervention on acute care use, advanced care planning, and patient reported outcomes among adults with advanced stages of cancer. So congratulations to Dr. Patel's team. Our next award is best publication focused on a pediatric Oh, can you see my screen just thank you, sir? Okay, perfect. Uh, best uh, focus on a pediatric population. Um, you can see the newsletter, right, Selena? Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, is Dr. Wang's team uh, with their uh, publication, Improving Efficiency on Pediatric Hospital Medicine with uh, Scheduled-Based Family Center round. So congratula congratulations to Dr. Wang's team. Uh, and then for a second year in a row, we have given uh, best publication uh, focused on health uh, uh, healthcare workers, uh, Gian Tropanati and team uh, uh, focused on uh, VA health care workers and their publication is titled Promising Strategies to Support COVID-19 Vaccination of Healthcare Personnel, Qualitative Insights, and BHA National Implementation. So congratulations to this team. And then finally, for the first time ever, we are recognizing a publication that was uh, first authored by a trainee at Stanford and the winner of this award uh, with Carolyn Park, a fellow in Stanford Geriatrics, uh, with her publication, Association Between Im uh, Implementation of Geriatric Trauma Clinical Pathway and Changes in Rates of Delirium in Older Adults with Traumatic Injury. So congratulations to Carolyn and her team. Um, and I would like to thank all the, author, uh, all the authors who submitted, all the judges who volunteered the time, and also our volunteers who helped with technical support. Um, but thank you all again, and we hope you consider uh, submitting to next year's award. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam, and congratulations to all of the winners. I had uh, the privilege of uh, reading the abstracts and papers, and it, they were just awesome. So much, so many papers that I didn't know about coming out of Stanford. So um, it's just really exciting to actually have uh, the, the platform to showcase that work. Um, so congratulations. So without further ado, I'm excited to present Dr. Nigam Shah, um, who will be uh, talking about building a fair, useful, reliable uh, models at Stanford Healthcare. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Shaw is a professor of medicine of bio biomedical informatics at Stanford, associate CIO for data science, and a member of the bio biomedical informatics uh, graduate program. And he's also the clinical informatics um, uh, part of the fellowship. He is probably perhaps most important to this group, uh, our chief data scientist for Stanford Healthcare, which is a relatively uh, new role for him 
His research focuses on combining machine learning and prior knowledge in medical ontologies to enable cases of learning health systems. We, we I think we talk every, every week or every other week here when we get together on learning health systems. Um, he has excelled uh, tremendously both as a researcher and as an educator. He won the American Medical Informatics New Investigator Award in 2013. That's um, the, the top uh, professional organization in his field. Um, he also won the Stanford Biosciences Faculty Teaching Award uh, for his graduate class on data-driven medicine. I had the opportunity to take that class a few years ago, and um, there is there's no end to the complexity of uh, just the data coming out of the EHR, especially when it's in the written form. It was an amazing class, and um, we're really lucky to have smart people working on that challenge. Uh, he has a, an MBBS from Baroda Medical College in India, a PhD from Penn State University, and he did his postdoc training at Stanford University. And I will leave it there and turn it over to Nigam. And um, just a reminder of uh, the structure of how this typically works. Our speakers usually talk for 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to questions. So be thinking about your questions and feel free to put them in the chat during the talk and then uh, we'll go through them uh, at the end. All right, thank All right. you. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I see a lot of familiar names if not faces on the on the Zoom call. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to try and do, uh, hi, Steve, uh, a, a few former students, uh, uh, new people joining SHC, like to, I don't know, at least 10, 20 percent. All right. So I'm going to try to uh, do this via my iPad. So let's, let me make sure that that sharing works. Uh, there's two settings I have to go through, so it may or may not always work. And if it doesn't, I, yeah, this is not working. So give me just a second to turn the setting off. Let's see what off. Try one more time. And there's no way for me to pre-do this because uh, uh, it, it, it requires the Zoom to be live. This makes us all feel better with when we have our own technical <laughs> technical difficulties. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll try 30 seconds. And if it doesn't work, I'll start presenting in a non-interactive uh, way. Yeah, I can see what the issue is here. OK. They're on different networks. OK, switch it. Everybody was so impressed with what Nigam is trying to do when he taught our class last Friday that we wanted a separate presentation on how to use that iPad to present. So it's worth the wait. <laughs> All right, let's see. This is the last attempt. If it doesn't work, we'll we'll do it the regular way. All right. Zoom. Yep. It's uh, today. It's not going to work. I I know what the issues are, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it it won't work. Let let me do it today. All right. So we'll do it the simple way. Sorry about that. <clears throat> and uh, presentation share. OK, so you should be able to see my slides now. And I have lost all of you. I only see some of you just given the way Zoom layout is, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be OK. All right, so feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, what I'm going to try and do today is uh, share about a little bit about this process that we are trying to put up at our institution on building fair, useful, and reliable models at Stanford Healthcare. Some of you are even part of that uh, uh, process, and uh, I hope to engage more of you in this. Okay. So as context, where I'm coming from here is this data science team that we put together as part of my new role uh, with the health system. And the team does four things. We strive to maintain thought leadership and presence in responsible AI in healthcare. And this little Mercedes-Benz logo is a good acronym shorthand. Remember that, that it's an interplay of the model, the policy, uh, and the action. And then we'll dive into that today. And then stemming from that work, uh, which is about 25-ish publications to date, is this process to assess whether a particular AI guided work situation will be fair, useful, reliable, and have monetary value. 
And I, I underscore the monetary value because if it is not sustainable, we get stuck in a condition I like to call pilotitis. Like we can do things as pilots, but if we can't find a way to sustain them, we actually increase chaos in the system. And then in order to enable all of this, uh, uh, we have a, a team that is creating the processes and the infrastructure to be AI ready as an organization. I see uh, Juan Banda is on the call uh, and I, I can't see others. If there might be Nikesh Kotecha, uh, leads this team in partnership with Anurang Revri, our chief enterprise architect. And then the last but not least piece is to ident oops, identify and this keeps happening. There we go. Identify and execute three to five projects per year, given the size of the team. It's we're not that big, uh, where the use of AI generates enterprise value. And what I have on screen here is our FY23 operational plan, which some of you might even have been involved in authoring. And I just put that up there as a visual to say what we do has to connect with one or more of the bullet points up there. And if it doesn't, then we need to make sure that the organization is ready to put that on the uh, next year's operational plan. Because otherwise, there's no alignment between what the organization wants and, and where the science is headed. So that's our four-part uh, uh, work. All right, so let's dive in. The this this little logo up here um, started out with a, a, a program funded by one of the SHC board members, Mark Leslie, and uh, what that has led to is this articulation of this phenomena that a lot of you probably intuitively understand is that in order to get anything useful and reliable from algorithm-guided algorithm care, there's the interplay of these three parties, the model, which is the equation, let's say the pool cohort equation as an example, and the output it produces, which is typically in number. So we have an equation that gives us a number, but then alongside that is the policy and capacity saying, when that number is above a certain value or below a certain value, we shall do something what that thing is, and what is our capacity to do so. And then the properties of the intervention itself, the, the benefits and the harms per sec. So as a very trivial example, if the model is the pool cohort equation, which outputs 10-year risk of cardiovascular risk, the policy says if that number is above 7.5%, thou shall prescribe 40 milligrams of torvastatin, and our capacity to prescribe statins is unlimited. And the benefits and harms of statins are probably the focus of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of publications. So that's sort of the frame of reference. And then in the middle is this interplay of all of these things that gives us uh, uh, the benefit that would arise from using an algorithm to guide care. And I say algorithm and not always AI because there's nothing fundamentally different between the risk stratification that's done by the pool cohort equation or any other MD cal calculator and a fancy deep neural net that's outputting a probability of some event happening. Like from a functional standpoint, they serve the same purpose, which is to either risk stratify or, I mean, basically risk stratify by what, what based on what someone has, a diagnostic function or what they're going to get, a prognostic function. Okay. So a bunch of papers, a few models deployed. The thing I'm the most proud of, and this is you know joint work with many people, including you know Vinnie Tutberg and and folks in the uh, palliative care division. Uh, we've over 2,400 people whose care has now been improved because of this, because of a few models we've deployed and the interplay between managing our policies, capacities uh, to act and so on. Okay. So now I'm going to rewind uh, and say, you know, when we th first wrote about this, uh, for how do we make predictive models useful in practice, we laid it out as this nice, beautiful left to right arrow with eight clean steps and four nice colors. Uh, and we would go sequentially from defining the use case, building the model, uh, uh, figure, formulating the model in terms of what is it that we're trying to uh, predict or, uh, or uh, classify the yellow steps about building the model and how do we 
make sure it's fair, uh, the IT feasibility, assessing utility, work capacity, and then going on to monitoring both the model and the workflow, and then also prospective evaluation that does the running system have the impact we hope. Now, looks nice, easy to describe in a paragraph, but I can imagine all of you can envision that you know real life is a little bit more complicated than this. So in the end, I'll show you what this picture looks like today, but just wanted to show that this is where we started. And this figure is from this paper, a framework for making predictive models useful in practice. All right, so as we embark on this journey and we had this nice little you know, four colored thing, we said, all right, well, let's first look at what, what does the community writ large recommends about doing responsible AI? And so that led us to this publication. It's in JAMA Network Open, uh, led by Jonathan Liu, one of our med students. And each row here is a particular recommendation, or and I like to sort of make fun of it a little bit, a proclamation that says, this is how thou shall do good AI. And you know, I'm, I'm part of two of them, so it's okay, I can make fun of this. Uh, and the columns are the, the different steps that we're looking at. It's the same color coding, blue, yellow, green, red. And then we bucketed the recommendations that were collectively made into these columns. So the union of these 16 or so proclamations, about 220 recommendations. And as you can see that about 104 of them are about how thou shall build the model. But if we care about fairness and equity and deployments and practice and value to the healthcare system, those are the things that are now bounded by that purple box. And we got squat. I mean, there's, there's not much guidance on that. It was shocking. So, all right, well, in, in a way that's good because now you know, we have something, something to offer. Uh, so we started investigating these aspects on how shall we conceptualize fairness uh, in the context of responsible AI? How should we assess utility? How should we consider deployment design? It's about a five-year journey that I just laid out this last Friday, and that takes a while. Can't do it in 20 minutes, uh, but I'll give you the highlights today. All right, so being fair and ethical. So there, I like to break down fairness into three bullet points. The first is, and I'm going to go back here, about the model in the sense that does the equation when it produces an, a number, does it produce the number the same way for everybody or does it have a systematic difference in its output by whatever protected subgroup you choose to define? You know, sex, skin color, geography of origin, ethnicity, whatever. So that's about the model. Then there is a notion of fairness that's about the policy and capacity, which is Given a number of a model and its output, is there a systematic difference in the allocation of some benefit? And that is what a lot of people really care about when, when, when we say the word fairness. And then the third is if there is no, so let's say first there's no systematic difference in the output of the model, there's no systematic difference in the allocation of the intervention, or, or some you know, benefit in the public health sense. Is there a systematic benefit, the third piece, in the accrual of some outcomes? So if I use the pool cohort equation as an example, you know, we all know that the pool cohort equations output is systematically different for people with certain characteristics, you know, Southeast Asians, men, women, white, black, but we don't get bent out of shape about it because like I never got denied a statin because my number was 7.2% and not 7.5%. So there's not a systematic difference in the accrual of some benefit as a result of that difference in the model output. And then we don't really track whereby prescribing over or under prescribing statins, are we making a difference in terms of the consequences as in reducing heart attacks? And one of my students uh, uh, who now works with Sherry Rose, she actually looked at this in terms of, can we conceptualize fairness 
in terms of removing differences in the net consequences of taking a model, combining it with the policy, aka the guideline, and then seeing what is the net result. So that's the three parts. So now in this plot, I'm only showing you the examination of systematic difference in the model output for a few protected subgroups for which we had enough sample size. So x-axis is predicted probability, y-axis is true probability. In this case, this is probability of death in the next three to 12 months. And as you can see at our decision threshold, there's, there's not that much difference amongst female, non-female, black, non-black. I have a plot of this exact same audit for a end of life care model provided by a vendor. And some of you saw that on Friday. <laughs> I'm not gonna show it here, this is being recorded. Uh, you know, what we have here is pretty darn good is, is, is what I'll leave it at. And uh, again, Jonathan Liu uh, led this work in partnership with at least 25, 30 other people took us about 115 hours of work to do this kind of a fairness audit and only touches the first bullet point. We're not yet looking at the systematic difference in accrual of the benefit or the consequences yet. All right, then being ethical. <clears throat> so Danton Carr, uh, who some of you probably know, is uh, one of the few ethicists who wants to automate himself. Uh, I'm going to say that a little bit tongue in cheek. I mean, typical ethics assessments take a while. You know, you have to sit down, do interviews. Uh, you might even end up doing some uh, ethnography studies and so on. His hypothesis is that we can't do that every, every step, every time. But we can perhaps use the existence of value clashes or value mismatches to clue us in to where problems will arise so we can do a deeper dive there. So that's sort of the, the core idea. What I'm showing you on screen here is uh, that same framework applied to identify ethical concerns in the use of machine learning guided advanced care planning. Each column is a stakeholder here. We had three patients, clinicians, the designer of the model. Each row is a, is a concern. And we're trying to identify by interviews uh, which hopefully will turn into questionnaires so that we, that we can scale them and, and, and find uh, where are the, the value mismatches. And I'll, I'll point out one, uh, look, using a pen, let's see if that works, that here is one of the mismatch where the, the values of the three stakeholders about who, what to do with the output of the model is not in agreement. And that allows us to clue into that and say, all right, why is there a disagreement? What is it that people are concerned about? And then change your solution uh, accordingly. All right. <clears throat> Another big thing is this notion of being clear about achievable impact. So again, coming back to fairness, uh, as I mentioned before, it's three parts, the model, the, uh, the uh, intervention, and then the consequences. This is looking at consequences in the presence of a policy. So on the x-axis is a percentage of population intervened. The y-axis is the number of outcomes realized or outcomes achieved. You know, let's say you're prescribing statins. How many people are you prescribing the statin to? And how many outcomes in terms of heart attacks are you preventing? And different policies uh, land you at different points on this graph. So random allocation, you know, it'll work about half the time, no surprise there. What we found is that people who practice and trade in the field of algorithmic fairness are overly occupied with equalizing the model of the output by things such as demographic parity, equalized odds, and things like that. But when you intersect that with existing guidelines, the answer is not something we like. And so we, we do need to look at all three things, the model, the policy, and the, uh, the consequence uh, if we really want to sort of have holistic uh, fairness evaluations. The other part of uh, being clear about achievable impact is like nuts and bolts. Um, on the x-axis is a rank-ordered list of cases that thou shall have to follow up given a model's output. 
And uh, on the y-axis is utility per patient. It's negative value. So as you go up, you get less utility per patient. But as you go down the list, you know, let's say first patient gets you 100 bucks of utility. The second one is 95. Third one is 90, uh, 93. But then you're accumulating. So cumulative utility is going up in, the, in that way. And so you know, it goes up for a while and then goes down, diminishing returns, you know, quite intuitive. And there's a maximal point. And the question we ask is, given our capacity, how far down the list can we get? It's a simple question, but really important to ask because we might be making predictions and flagging people for follow-up, but if we just don't have the capacity or we don't have the workflow in order to process that list, we're not gonna get any benefit out of that. So being clear about achievable impact. So these are the kinds of things that we routinely do upfront for uh, uh, groups that come to us for a firm assessment. And then the last one is, a, is an Excel analysis, basically asking if we routinely predicted and acted, what would happen? And uh, you know, the exact numbers here are, are, are fiction. It's a homework assignment in one of my classes, uh, but think of four buckets. There is the cost to build and deploy the model, which then ultimately leads us to this one number, which is what is our cost for a prediction? Think of it like a screening test, you know. Uh, it costs whatever, 90 bucks to screen a human being for their lipid profile. So that's the like cost to screen per patient. The cost per prediction. Then there's the intervention cost. If someone is screened positive by the model, we're gonna do something. And how much is that something going to cost the health system? Or you know, society writ large. Um, so we're gonna screen 100 people. We might be flag 20 of them. And given our policy, we're gonna follow up. We say 12 of them. So we're gonna spend $22,000 12 times. That's the idea. Now, doing that leads to some benefit accrued by society or payer or patients writ large. You know, disease prevented, quality of life, whatever is the favorite metric to quantify the benefit of doing something. But then this fourth piece is how much of that goodness accrued to humanity ours? And that gets to sustainability. Because if every time we make a prediction and take some action, we lose 5,000 bucks and the insurer saves 10,000, we're not gonna be able to sustain it. Every improvement work that uses algorithms or technology, I think should go through this analysis purely for at least minimum for ensuring that we can sustain this in the long haul. Because if we just, keep adding project after project after project, each one of which is going to cost us something. You know, as the joke goes in academic medical centers, we lose money on grants, we lose money on patient care, we lose money on education, and we'll make it up in volume. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Um, so that's the business analysis part. So all of this, like we conceptualize it in about 13 different steps now. And I promised you, I'll show you a, a, a graph I'll, that's coming in a second. So this process is what we call the form assessment. Uh, it's a process to evaluate the fairness, usefulness, and reliability of models guiding care. And our idea is to assess each use case prior to deployment for patient care. And you know, the screenshot is of a, a draft version of such a report that would then break it down into all of these different things that we've been talking about, and then make a recommendation saying, uh, we think this is gonna work, uh, or if we say we, we think this is not going to work, we tell you why we think so. And so far, uh, we've had uh, incoming from three kinds of situations, you know, faculty ideated use cases, vendor products, uh, we're just dipping our toes into accepting an enterprise need and then fleshing out the solution ourselves. And hopefully that's where we get to partner with uh, lots of you on the call. Uh, we've done four form assessments between October and January. Uh, and here is uh, it, what it looks like. I mean, of course, it's not a linear process. The different steps, uh, the blue, green, yellow, red, have all been moved around. 
we found sort of three additional things that are really important. Those are in that light lavender kind of color, the ethical concerns, business case, and so on. And then once we did a couple, we also found there are these all of these hidden operational steps that are like not very scientific, but somebody has to do that work in order for us to do this on a repeatable basis, uh, answering questions about what and why are we doing anything in AI guided care, how will we do it, and then assessing did the work. Um, so that's uh, that's the uh, sort of under the hood, and I bring it back to uh, this this triangle. The colors actually are consistent. All the yellow stuff is yellow. Blue is uh, you know half of here. The blue and the uh, and the and the lavender, and the red and green uh, are in these different parts. So it's really a mix of all of these things, and at least my informatics colleagues tend to be a little bit over-indexed on the model. And I think we need to start paying more attention to, to this part, which I would imagine is of higher interest uh, to people working on improvement science. And uh, more of these URLs, and I'll stop here. This is a pre-pandemic picture of the team. Pretty much everyone here has graduated. I think only three people in this picture are still here, uh, <laughs> but it's still the nicest picture I have of my team. So that's the one I use. All right, I'll stop sharing and uh, we can have uh, questions. Great, thank you so much, Nigam. I um, that that's a lot to digest. I was looking at those optimization curves and um, haven't haven't looked at some of those in a while. Um, I just wanted to clarify, you said um, the statement, uh, so much time focused on equalizing the model of output, but then when you in intersect that with existing guidelines, you get a result that we don't like. Can you like elaborate more on that or give an example? Yeah, so we have two examples. The most often the, the we don't like part of the result is that we spend so much time and energy like making the math work better and then it does nothing because the policy says thou shalt bin the output in high, medium, low, three buckets, and unless there's movement between the three bins or net reclassification, nothing changes. That's like the majority case. Sometimes, and we just had a paper out by Richard Yu, uh, who examined a, a bunch of commonly used MD calc calculators uh, and showed that even though, uh, like basically the distribution of the scores is different in different communities, like the prior distribution, then when you equalize it, it seems everything has now become fair uh, and you're using the same threshold for everybody, but you might actually net reclassify people in a direction you don't want to. So that just came out in the American Journal of Managed Care. Um, and so th that's the rarity. The commonest one is like you do all of this math and it does nothing because it's just a wash. Right. It's often uh, the human part, the policies that and the feasibility part that that is that is limiting it. Um, we have some questions coming into the chat. Um, an early question focused on, uh, I think this was uh, the like fair and ethical, maybe was the headline of the slide. Um, this person is asking the, about the gold standard against which you, which you assessed fairness and accuracy of the advanced care planning predictive model. So what was considered the gold standard in that setting? So in that setting, go, so there's two parts. In this, I, I'm reading this one as the um, ensuring that our model output has no systematic difference for people belonging to different protected subgroups. And we looked at two, female, non-female, black, non-black, because those were the only two groups for which we had enough sample size. And here, because this was a retrospective analysis, and we're predicting three to 12 month mortality, we had gold standard truth from uh, on who is alive and who, who's dead. And so what we're looking at is if our model predicted say 62% mortality for you know, 100 people, did 62 of them actually pass uh, in reality? So it's basically the metric of calibration. And we wanted to ensure that we're equally calibrated for every subgroup. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Marcy, hey. oh, go ahead. You know, I'm sorry. I was the person who posted that question. And then yeah. I have at least sort of to the next quest, the next follow up, which is um, what if, um, are there situations in which the subgroups themselves would be factors in the um, the predictive model? Whereas, you know, the, the, the 
for example, as in the pooled cohort equation, uh, for different um, or ra racial groups might have different risks, uh, risk levels. Yep. So that I would uh, highlight Richard Yu's paper. Uh, I mean, right now there's a lot of focus on and soul searching on what does race mean and is it biological or is it social and how, how do we factor that in? And uh, like my current views on the topic are like what we're really after, at least from the medical sense, is trying to answer the question, where are you from? And historically, where you were from had correlated with your environmental exposures and your genetic heritage. Like my ethnicity would put me at higher risk for having a G6PD deficiency. And I would not want my doctor to be race blind on that. Now, in the US, it has become a flashpoint and you can't talk about these things. Uh, and so what happens is uh, that there are things out there where there may be a role for these variables, but we're blindly excluding them. And that is what Richard's analysis shows that even when you take an equation that doesn't have these variables as inputs, you do run into situations that the prior distribution of whatever output is different for different populations. And it is foolish to pretend that it isn't. Now, we might not want to call it race just because of the connotations it carries in this country, but we need a name for that phenomena. And to use a very extreme example, you take somebody from you know, Scandinavia and you take some, uh, someone from Central Africa, the, the group that used to be called pygmies. I mean, there is a definite difference in height. And to deny that is, I think, nonsensical. Like if you're designing an airplane chair and you say, oh, I have these group, two group of humans, one median height is six feet, the other median height is five feet, and I'm just gonna pretend that not, no difference exists, that doesn't help anybody. But it's a tough conversation to have. Uh, Yeah, it's reminding me of an analogy with um, just to take it to more like health policy, where you have different health systems and maybe a high income area versus a low income area. They treat different populations, they have different performance outcomes. And the temptation is to say, well, you know, those patients in the lower income areas, they're sicker. Um, so we should just kind of normalize, you know, the performance outcomes and, and pay everybody the same in terms of national incentives. But there's been equivalent research that has said, no, actually, you're normalizing the poor performance. Like you're, mm -hmm. you're yeah. um, you want you want that information to show up and to not, you know, make everybody the same. We're we're doing yeah, yeah. Uh, people a disservice. So yeah. there's parallels across across settings. Yeah, basically, um, whenever there is a difference in pr the prior distribution of anything, and we try to make it look similar by some misguided math we kind of hide the problem. Yeah, I mean, these are these are hard conversations to have um, and but important conversations to have, certainly. Um, I see Marcy put uh, Marcy Winget put um, something in the chat. Marcy, do you want to ask your question aloud? Um, yeah, um, first, I just want to say this was just such a great presentation and I'm just so delighted to um, hear about all of the angles that you're actually uh, thinking about and and em, em, employing in in this work. Um, and <clears throat> something I frequently think about at Stanford in particular is how, <clears throat> excuse me, excited people get about technology without thinking about how it's actually going to be used and implemented. And if it is even <laughs> at all practical, even if it's, it might be super exciting, but not practical. So um, uh, before you showed the one graph uh, talking about capacity, um, I was thinking, gosh, I wonder um, if you're thinking about, so for, so usually the way I hear about uh, this type of technology being deployed is uh, via a BPA that gets sent. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of studies that have been done that show doctors ignore BPAs and if if they can, and when they can't, they usually often find them annoying. And so um, 
I guess I have a, a two prong question. One is around like, are there some different approaches or like how can you make people care about those BPAs? But I feel like that also fits in with my capacity question, which is like, how do you even figure out what you have capacity for? Like, do I have capacity for this additional thing if there's all these other things? And it seems like whether or not you have capacity for A depends on how many other things and what the other things are mm -hmm. that are happening. So yeah. I don't know it, it, if you can answer any of that. <laughs> yes, I'll, 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 I think, I think I'm, I'm tracking where you're going with this. Uh, so let me, let me try. Uh, the, the BPA one is a sim, is a simpler one. Uh, not everything has to be operationalized as a BPA and probably shouldn't be. So in this case, what we're the way this is operationalized is, is you take a set and you turn it into a sorted list. And you don't show an alert on any given patient. You create a, a queue saying, here are the 22 human beings today that need an advanced care planning conversation. So that's a slightly different way to operationalize it than just an interruptive alert. Uh, the second, the capacity part is is a little bit is interactive. So you know, you can set the model's alerting threshold at whatever level. And so we first engaged with the team and showed them that the heuristics that were currently in use found 21% of the true patients that needed advanced care planning at the expense of them having to rummage through two and a half charts to confirm the one true case. And then we said, all right, now we got a deal for you. Deal number one, is we can keep the threshold such that you will continue to find 21% of the true cases and your chart review work will go down in half. That pretty much everyone we flag, you will agree that it's worth follow-up. You don't have to rummage through two and, a half, two and a half charts. And so the other side of the deal is if you're okay with the current two and a half chart of rummaging through, we can boost recall to 84%. That will lead to a 79% increase in the rate at which the workflow for advanced care planning is triggered. So they say, well, we do want the 84%, not miss people, but we don't have the capacity. So, all right, came up with a way to, and Ron Lee was involved, you know, uh, uh, Lisa Shea was involved, uh, Kavita Ramchandran, I mean, lots of people are involved, uh, Vinnie Tudberg, of course, to then come up with a team-based care model. And so trained beyond just the clinician, we have physical therapists, we have spiritual care workers, residents, physicians, stepping in to have these conversations following the serious illness conversation guide. And so we can increase capacity. Now in the simulation setting, we can have a whole bunch of scenarios, say, you know, 20 people got flagged and you only, handle 10% of the workload, what is the presumed net, what fraction of the presumed net benefit can you capture? If you process 20%, 30%, 80%. And so you use that to say like, what's, how many do we need to be able to handle in a day to get to 80, 90% efficiency? And then backtrack from there to design your capacity. But again, it could, it could, ha it could have non-trivial effects, because let's say you have a choke point that requires patient transport, and I'm sort of making this up at this point. And if one service starts using more patient transport, it's gonna show up somewhere else where their workflows get choked up. We're not at a stage of maturity where we can simulate the whole health system yet. So we're still doing it locally. And we saw one example, there was a radiology example where we say we can automatically calculate coronary artery calcium score from routine CT scan, like awesome. And then what? Oh, we'll just alert the PCP. I was like, do you know our median time to a PCP appointment right now? <laughs> you know, so there, there's some issues like that that do come up. Yeah, thanks. Because that's what I was thinking is that um, uh, that's a great process that you that you went through, but it seems like it could change over time. It could, and Especially yes, if like advanced care planning came up because people aren't doing it, even though they should be, there's probably a dozen other things like that out there. So it just seems like it's a little bit of a, becomes an issue of competing priorities. So mm -hmm. anyway, 
I see Ali's hand up. He was part of the fairness audit. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Nigam. This has been a really great conversation and very interesting presentation. Um, sort of as a follow up to that last question, I was interested in how you think about do some of these models have a shelf life, not from a technological perspective, mm -hmm. but also because, you know, the model, the trigger may actually be doing more than we, what we think it is, it might be changing culture in a way that is mm -hmm. no longer needed in the future, or, you know, there might be something else that we're not measuring that's changing um, that, so I, that needs to be reassessed in some sort of capacity. 100%. There's a beautiful article by Sharon Davies at Vanderbilt. I think the title is Why Models Will Be the Victims of Their Own Success or something like that, which is getting to the essence of what you're saying. We've seen that behavior uh, in the children's hospital where Keith Morse and one of my other stu uh, students, Scotty uh, Fleming, uh, were part of implementing the Braden QD index. And just the fact that you had an initiative around the Braden QD index led to changes in the care protocols around pressure ulcers, and hence the validity of the Braden QD score went down. <laughs> so yeah, that does happen. I would say, you know, every six months to one year is worth relooking at these things to say, are our assumptions still valid? And, you know, should we shut the damn thing down? Um, and Margaret Wang as a follow up, Maggie Wang as a follow up said, maybe a related question is how does a model continue to be recalibrated? Yeah. So, yeah. so that we can monitor. So part of the monitoring was, you know, is the follow through workflow happening? The other part is, is looking at a whole bunch of numerical metrics about model performance. And whenever we see a rapid shift, that's the time to reassess. Sure. And I, I also see a comment from uh, Monique Lambert about important to distinguish biological versus social determinants 100 percent and right now they're conflated and we avoid talking about the biological because we're scared of the social differences yeah great point um one other question in the chat we missed is the idea to build these initiatives in-house or do you do an mvb which i think is standing for minimal uh viable business model potentially with other vendors so um don't have a clear opinion on that one. Uh, our hope is to first use this for in-house initiatives, for the things that our faculty, uh, quality teams, improvement teams do. The process is amenable to evaluate uh, uh, a vendor's product being sold to us, but this is not something where we would like offer it to someone saying, hey, come to us and we'll evaluate your business plan. Like this is, this is not a incubator sort of, uh, you know, a startup factory. This is about, does this make sense for us? And it, it, it would be offered first to our own internal people. Yeah. And I got a correction there. Make versus buy. Thank you for that. Ah, um, um, MVB. That's, that's one, a new one on me. Uh, um, so that's, a, that's actually a really good one. Um, it could be used for build versus buy decisions. And there's a lot of things that if we did ourselves, just the given our co operating cost structure, we might be better off buying or things that we're buying, we might be better off doing ourselves. Uh, we've so far not done that comparison saying, you know, if we just use this thing from a company versus build it ourselves, but yeah, that, that readout can be helpful for that decision. Yeah, I, I think along those lines, I had a question around uh, where is the, you're, you're talking about having that sustainable business model, kind of thinking about that early up front. When do you, when does that like do not pass go happen for these models, like the, the financial sustainability piece? Yeah. So my job in the data science team is to produce an honest report. So you think about, you know, lending, uh, the, the, uh, the people who do the assessments only rate can you afford the house? And then it's a loan officer who decides whether to lend money or not. So the equivalent of the loan officer is the, uh, is the data science executive committee that is staffed mostly by C-suite uh, uh, people in SHC and, and a few department chairs. And uh, it is entirely possible that something is a liability in the long run but the institution deems that it is worth doing for other reasons. Yeah, so so trade-offs there. And I exactly. know, um, yeah, we're, we are, uh, we like to end, uh, the goal is 10 minutes prior to the top of the hour to give people some time back. 
Um, but we'll just close it uh, by by giving you an opportunity, Nigam, to um, if you if there's anything this community can do to help, you know, this AI. Um, you talked about being AI ready readiness as an organi organization. Um, if you have any message to this community regarding that, I think I think people would be interested. And then maybe how how people I mean people can email you, of course, if they have different ideas, but how they could get involved. I think it would be great to get engagement on the side of designing the interventions. Because often, at least in the few that we've done, the person building the algorithm isn't best positioned to think through all of the dependencies in the downstream workflow. And people who've done health services research and people who've done uh, improvement projects are way better suited to like design that downstream intervention arm uh, so that's definitely an area of potential collaboration. And, you know, a lot of people coming to us would benefit from that expertise. Uh, and then the third is like of the three to five that we deploy, it would be good to do a prospective evaluation saying, do these things actually, you know, work as advertised? I mean, very high chance they don't. <laughs> I think Stacy might have dropped off. Yeah, there she's back again. I am. Yeah, just a momentary lapse there. All right. Thank you so much, Nigam. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for joining. We'll look forward to seeing you in the next, uh, in two weeks for our next talk. Bye. Hope everyone has a nice Valentine's Day. Bye. Thank you.